<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for your patience. Thank you for uh, coming out in such great numbers tonight. Can you all hear me outside? Do you give me a little wave? Oh, a little nod. Okay, thank you. Um, before I begin tonight, I'd just obviously like to thank our friends at uh, Edition Olivier for making uh, for making tonight's event possible, for bringing Nicole Krauss uh, to Paris to celebrate the publication uh, of the, the, the French translation of, uh, of her work. Um, Jules Epstein has vanished into the desert, leaving no trace but his monogrammed briefcase. A year ago, he caught the disease of radical charity, unburdening himself of his many possessions and assets before departing from New York for Israel. Strange, his worried children reflect, that a man so firm and decisive in life had left them with a final act that was utterly ambiguous. A young novelist, afflicted with, the, with writer's block, leaves Brooklyn in a failing marriage for the Tel Aviv Hilton, hoping that her stay there might prove a catalyst to her work. Instead, she gets caught up in an intrigue with Friedman, a retired literature professor who may or may not have access to lost writing by Franz Kafka. As Forrest Dark advances, the stories of Epstein and the novelist don't so much intertwine but rhyme with each other, working together to conjure a profound, daring and unsettling meditation upon how apparently stable lives, stable realities, might suddenly disintegrate, upon the quest for self-realisation in our modern world and upon stories we tell, in novels, through recorded history, but also to each other and ourselves. Add to this that Forrest Dark is also funny, extraordinarily so, and it will come as no surprise that the great Philip Roth was moved to call it a brilliant novel, declaring himself full of admiration for Nicole Krauss. The New York Times has called Nicole Krauss one of America's most important novelists. In addition to Forrest Dark, she's the author of Man Walks Into a Room, which was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book of the Year, as well as the international bestsellers Great House, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and the Orange Prize, and The History of Love, which won the Sarayan Prize for International Literature, and France's Prix du Meilleur Livre Étranger, and was shorted for the Orange, Medicis and Femina Prizes. In 2007, she was selected as one of Granta's Best Young American Novelists, and in 2010, she was chosen by The New Yorker for their 20 Under 40 list. Her fiction has been published in The New Yorker, Harper's, Esquire, and Best American Short Stories, and her books have been translated into more than 35 languages. The San Francisco Chronicle called Forrest Dark a triumphant new novel that suggests a determination to stretch conventional narrative in unconventional directions. While writing in The Guardian, Emily St. John Mandel held it as blazingly intelligent, elegantly written, and a remarkable achievement. Please join me in welcoming Nicole Krauss to Shakespeare and Company. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I guess where we should begin is with our two uh, principal protagonists, just introducing them a little bit. So let's begin with uh, Jules Epstein. Yes. First of all. Uh, let's. <laughs> so, I mean, my, my, it's funny, I mentioned um, uh, the, the quote from Philip Roth uh, about the book. And in, in many ways, at least when we first meet Jules Epstein, he seems in a, quite, almost a kind of a Rothian character mm. in the sort of the, uh, the volume at which he lives life. Yes. Um, he is certainly... Uh, vibrant mm -hmm. he's authoritative he is nothing if not certain he always knows exactly what needs to be said what he wants to say so he has absolutely no need in his life for silence and this is a person of e enormous success in the material realm mm -hmm. in the material world um, I mean that both in, in terms of just life itself, um, but also having acquired many possessions and beautiful paintings and art collection and all kinds of things. And at 68 years old, so in the wake of his parents' deaths, one after another quite quickly, um, and leaving a marriage of, you know, many decades, something begins to rise up in him and I think it's a kind of a, um, doubt mm. and to a man like this doubt is somewhat new mm. and that doubt if we were to give it language it would say something like what if I was wrong you know what if uh, all of this certainty with which I strode through my life was false or inaccurate and what if there's something I neglected? And so it's, I mean, it's a late doubt to have in, in such a man's life. Um, but for him, it begins to, um, to precipitate a turning away from the material. He begins to, as you said, divest. He has this, you know, catches this disease of radical charity. Well, what he's really doing, he's just divesting himself of everything that represented him up until that point. 
and he begins slowly to turn away from the material and towards what I guess we can call uh, the spiritual realm, which is this realm that in a sense he never touched or he realized he, he failed to um, give place to in his life, in his mind. Mm -hmm. And of course, when we we first meet him, um, or rather, we we meet his his absence, um, so to speak. We we learned that he has we learned has that, that he has vanished. We learned that the kind of man he was, and we learned that all is set that essentially remains of him is this monogrammed briefcase that was found in uh, yeah. uh, in the the Israeli desert. And I was just curious, what, from a from a writing perspective, um, when you when you conceived this character of Jules Epstein, were you aware of all the twists and turns in his journey that what would take him from this one uh, state t to the other or did that come as a surprise to you? Everything I have ever <laughs> written has come as a surprise to me. I've never ever known where I've been going in a novel. I can't imagine what it would be like to be that kind of writer and, and wow how wonderful but also I don't know it's just not me because mm. That kind of writer who knows in advance every twist and turn, in a sense, has the answers to the questions mm -hmm. before they're even posed. And for me, a novel is... They, uh, novels are searching vehicles. They are about uh, what it is to sustain the question. And it's uncomfortable to sustain the question. The question means, I don't know. I don't know where this book will take me. And on some level, I am going to be surprised. I may be hurt. I may be partially destroyed before I can rebuild mm -hmm. some sense of myself. I will be betrayed by this book because it won't happen in ways that I expect. But it will be a process of discovery. And I don't know any other way of mm -hmm. writing. I simply don't. Um, I wish I did because psychologically, emotionally, it would be <laughs> vastly easier. But I don't. And, and, and this is my way. So what I had in the beginning was this sense of this man, the sketch that I just gave you of a, of a, of a character. I, and I had the, at the same time, the twin notion that he vanished, mm -hmm. that he was gone. How does something that is so sure and so certain and so present cease to exist? What is the process by which such a man could cease to exist, can kind of um, dissolve from this world? Mm -hmm. And that was a question I couldn't have possibly answered except by writing the book. Mm -hmm. You remind me of the um, a quotation, I think it was from Rachel Lombard, which, where he said, literature is the question without the answer. Mm. I, I think that's right, and I don't set out to even provide the answers, really, and I, I don't mean that in a coy mm. way. I don't, you know, no novel that I've loved has given me an answer, it's given me the opportunity to live in the question mm -hmm. and the question is the place in which we have an, a chance to expand mm -hmm. you know to grow the answer were already complete mm -hmm. and in a way that sort of um, sense of uncertainty is what is what is besetting our other protagonist so the the, the, the young novelist who uh, whose account is written in, in the first person um, who has decided She's drawn, as I said in the introduction, to uh, to leave her family in Brooklyn and to go to specifically to the um, the Tel Aviv Hilton. Yes. Um, and I was just wondering if we could talk a little bit about. Um, firstly, would you say that the way you just described your process, um, your sort of uh, mindset as you're undertaking a novel, would you say that's something that's reflected? Uh, in this character, in the state that we find her at the beginning I, I of the I love book. how you're respectfully avoiding naming her. <laughs> yeah. That, um, well, her name is Nicole, and I'm sure we will get to that somehow or other, because we always do. But um, is her process as a writer similar to mine? Or her predicament. Her the predicament. One? Yeah. Um, which is to say the obsession with this hotel. The obsession with the, the obsession hotel and also the, the sort of sense of, um, of writer's block, of sort of a paralysis right. that we find yes. here in at the beginning. Yes. Um, yes, this um, obsession with this hotel was real for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I've been doing interviews all day and all day we're talking about this idea, you know, the, the line between what's real and what's invented. Uh -huh. And we're also constantly talking about Philip Roth because he's, of course, 
passed away and he's on everybody's mind and I suddenly in the last interview I did and then I promise I'll answer the question <laughs> try but the last interview I did I remembered something that he once told me which is that very very early on in his career he became completely frustrated with this idea of what so is this real is this something that really mm. happened to you and he found the most ingenious answer and that is was simply everything in this book really happened now what do you want to know <laughs> <laughs> and i think you know th this is my 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 impolite instinct and uh, he could get away with it i probably can't so i'm stuck <laughs> right answering the question but yes i i i felt that this hotel was somehow um an opportunity, mm -hmm. an opportunity to, and I couldn't figure out what it was, novelistically, what this opportunity was, but I became kind of obsessed with it in a way that my mind kept returning to it day after day. And now, in retrospect, what I can say is that, you know, those of you who don't know what the Tel Aviv Hilton looks like, well, there's a, it's here on the cover in, in a very small way, and in, there are pictures of it in the book, but you can see it's this completely imposing architecture right I mean it's built in the brutalist style l literally um, it's this grid which seems to give us a law about its reality or our reality like all architecture it's going to decide how we live in it how we move through it and yet my experience uh, as a child uh, going to this hotel where my family used to to vacation was quite the opposite. Uh, my memories there, spe I had specific memories that in, in a sense bent those very laws radically. Um, and rem so this hotel became the opposite of what it seems to be. Mm. <laughs> Isn't that how it happens? <laughs> the opposite of, of, uh, of a reality that imposes itself rather became in my mind this portal to otherworldliness, mm -hmm. to other kinds of reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, as a novelist, I'm always looking for those portals. Mm -hmm. mm, I think we as readers, uh, maybe just as human beings, are always looking for those mm -hmm. portals. And somehow I had this instinct that the Tel Aviv Hilton would be one, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know how. I didn't know how to make that pop open. And that's definitely uh, um, something which uh, that, that she is exp experiencing in the book. It's this sort of this this quest for for sort of almost unpicking the the fabric of reality. Yes. In a sense, um, and that's a sort of from, from from my point of view, that's the more interesting question about what is real and what is not. It's not so much you know, did these things happen to you? Are you you know, what is how much do you overlap with this character? But more her interrogation uh, of reality and her sense of of perhaps the sort of the life that she's been living and the way she's been approaching life was just perhaps one layer of reality one possible reality i mean she starts to get interested in the idea of the multiverse yes for example um and i'm curious about whether you talked about epstein's kind of religious uh, uh, sort of manifesting itself. Do you think... Uh, spiritual. Uh, spiritual, yeah. Different from religious, in my mind. Do you think in, in her case that is also a sort of the, the similar sort of instinct uh, manifesting itself? Um, well, they're, in a sense, they're, they're connected mm -hmm. um, in that I think in, in what, what does it mean to be spiritual? Mm -hmm. It means that we have some sense that there's something larger than what we can sense mm -hmm. or see. I think it's a sense of uh, that what is finite isn't the end all and be all. And I think those of us who grow up, um, we don't need religion for that. Mm -hmm. Those of us who grew up reading poetry, reading novels, looking at paintings, whatever it is, walking <laughs> through the woods, um, we, we begin to be trained 
in the sensation that there is something um, that maybe we've forgotten, mm -hmm. which we could, maybe we call for the lack, or, or we, f we we lost the, our touch with, mm -hmm. which is this sense of the infinite. Uh -huh. And I think we go to art in, in search of it, uh, or we go to other places in search of it. Some people go to nowadays to psychedelics in mm -hmm. search of it, which seems to be a very good place to find <laughs> it. Um, but but whatever it is, there 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 are there there is this capacity we have as human beings for for that opening mm -hmm. um, and some of us long for it more than mm -hmm. others I think when, when we ask this question of what is reality um, we begin to, to, to knock up against this mm -hmm. issue because we can look at reality and say well here we can describe it, it is what it is and we can put up a mirror to it but the, we can very easily begin to pull out the threads of what this perception of reality is whether we do that simply by turning to what we know about physics, for mm -hmm. example, and saying, well, we, we see all of this around us as solid, but we all learn that it's actually atoms in a void, mm -hmm. and that our per human perception teaches us to see it as solid because that's what we need in mm -hmm. order to survive. Or we can approach r reality from another angle and say, well, look, once we begin to scratch the surface, we find that there are all of these collective fictions mm -hmm. that we have agreed to believe in, like the fact that the paper in our wallets is worth mm -hmm. something, you know? And this is our reality, but is it, rea is it what, what version of mm -hmm. reality have we chosen for ourselves as, as a civilization, as individuals? Mm -hmm. The same goes to this, our sense of the self. What is the reality of the self? And this book is deeply mm -hmm. engaged with that question. The self, as, as I know it, as I think we all know it, is, uh, is a narrative. And we know that we use, we employ memory, which is a kind of creative act. Mm -hmm. It's not an accurate account of reality. We don't need, as human beings, a, an accurate account of reality. We need coherence. Mm -hmm. And we use our memory to create uh, a coherent narrative. And so, to what degree is that coherent narrative that we call the self reality? Mm -hmm. And so, I think just to to, um, to begin to take those apart, well, it's unnerving and it's liberating yeah. in the same breath. And that's um, I think of a moment where you're you write about this and you say no young child no young child naturally believes that reality is firm, and so it seems that there is this sort of this openness uh, that we're sort of that we're born with, and then it, we're essentially schooled in uh, in certain ways of looking at the world, and sort of and perhaps sort of uh, sort of pinioned into certain uh, certain realities. But then, as we see with uh, with Epstein and with Nicole in the novel, there's this moment. It might be through conscious choice, or it might be through life situations where that sort of starts to disintegrate, and that disintegrates at, um, at different, uh, different rates for different people. Yes. But it seems, um, as you said, sort of very, an unsettling experience to... Um, right, it just depends on the mindset mm -hmm. that one is in, you know. Um, I think there is an anxiety in giving up certainties. You know, I think of like the way that we live now, mm, we are... Uh, in a society that is obsessed, we are a moment in history that is obsessed with information, mm -hmm. with factual information, and we are we bow at the down at the altar of this, you know, of the altar of, of Google, mm -hmm. and. I guess that if we really look at that, we begin to see that there's an anxiety about not knowing, mm -hmm. about not being certain. And that anxiety is real because when we take away those things we can lean on, for sure, wh where are we? Mm -hmm. But I guess my I, I choose as a writer, as a thinker, to want to... Um, to, to turn to uncertainty for its value, mm. even if it's more uncomfortable. Because I think in turning our backs on it, we are really, um, we're also turning our backs on everything that it is a doorway to, mm -hmm. which is includes wonder, awe, our capacity for transformation. And mm -hmm. uh, we have to, you know, th think of this beautiful phrase of Keats, n negative capability, mm -hmm. w which is the, the ability to dwell in uncertainties without any irritable reaching after mm -hmm. fact, you know? It's not easy. It's not an easy place to be. And, and, and 
I understand the desire, mm. I have it in myself to just rely on what we think we know, mm. or the certainties we've decided are true. And yet, it limits us. Mm. It limits our capacity to, to grow. You make me think of one um, specific passage, which I think particularly is the fact you're in France, it, it, uh, we can't really, uh, we can't, can't really avoid. And, um, and it also c connects us a little bit to the, the title of the book. And I just, I'll just read this very um, quickly where you talk about Descartes. Yes. Where you say, since Descartes, knowledge has been empowered to a nearly unimaginable degree. But in the end, it didn't lead to the mastery and possession of nature he imagined, only to the illusion of its mastery and possession. In the end, we have made ourselves ill with knowledge. I frankly hate Descartes <laughs> and have never understood why his axiom should be trusted as an unshakable foundation for anything. The more he talks about following a straight line out of the forest, the more appealing it sounds to me to get lost in that forest, where once we lived in wonder and understood it to be a prerequisite for an authentic awareness of being and the world. Now we have little choice but to live in the arid fields of reason. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, it's certainly just an extraordinary passage in itself, but also it does bring us to the the subject or the the image of the forest which seems kind of connected to what you were just talking about yes. then and forests of course in um in myths and legends as it's sort of something quite archetypal to the forest as a place on, on the one hand of darkness and of fear but also of um of wonder and mystery and things that we yes. things that we can't understand and of course forests come up quite a bit uh, yes. during the book in different forms. I mean forms. the forest in, in those myths and legends always lays outside the law. Mm. And what law? <laughs> the law, uh, human law and the laws of reality, which are also human laws. Um, uh, it is. It stands in opposition to the city, which is uh, a reflection of human, the human sense of order. And it is, uh, it, it is an uncomfortable place, but it is uh, a magical place, mm -hmm. right? Magical for exactly those reasons. You can get lost and become something else or something totally unexpected can happen to you. Um, uh, you don't know where you'll find mm -hmm. yourself. Uh, and, and, and another thing you mentioned, which I never, I never heard before, but I thought a fascinating idea was that the, the great um, empires and great civilizations of Rome and Greece it has been it has been said that once they flattened their forests, that was the moment that they they started to collapse right, actually, and that right. they started to fall yeah, apart. Yes, um, it, this is an uh, an interesting parallel. I mean, this um, has to do, I suppose, with <laughs> this reminds me that I also read this theory once that um, the Roman Empire collapsed because the the pitch, the tar with which they lined their um, whatever you call it, their kegs of mm. wine, um, had has a substance in it that made them lose their minds uh -huh. a little bit. So, um, but uh, there are many theories uh -huh. about the that collapse of those empires. But it, it's it, when I was reading about Faris, I found it incredible to think of so much of the globe and particularly that part of the world mm. north africa the middle east covered with these forests that were you know all cut down for the timber mm -hmm. um and or agriculture to make way for agriculture and you know there there's so many ways to think about that one way to think about it is the sense in which we cut down this space mm -hmm. of being able to be lost um, of something that is the opposite of our control. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, Epstein, one of his uh, one of his ways he sort of wants to divest himself of some of his money is in a potentially in a reforestation uh, right. project in uh, in Israel. Yes, which is not entirely an invention, mm -hmm. although it's his idea is an extreme one. Uh -huh. But but of course there is this long history. Um, in, in first Palestine and then the state of Israel uh, of you know raising money in the diaspora for trees mm -hmm. you know to 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 replant Israel um, and one tree two tree but he has this idea of this you know hundreds of a forest of hundreds of thousands in the desert um, which I think is his you know well as many ways but it's his sense of um, resurrecting mm. something that he is um, sent it's a sense of what's been lost mm -hmm. for him and um, I've, of course I, I'm not conscious we're not going to speak for too much longer because I'm sure there are questions from the audience and uh, time is already getting on but we're just talking about the obviously the the region around the Mediterranean mm -hmm. and it's um, 
I mean, it's no coincidence that both characters in their sort of um, quest for self-realization, mm. to say it in a bit of a trite way, but uh, are drawn towards uh, are drawn towards Israel. Yes. And of course, particularly because in the in the Jewish tradition, this the question of of narrative and history and sort of uh, and storytelling is uh, is so strong. There's something again that you investigate. Yes, uh, I think it's that. I think it's a couple of things. Um, I mean, as a writer, Israel had draws for me for many reasons as a setting for this story. Um, but one of them was this juxtaposition of thousands of years of history. I mean, this you, you cannot take a step in Israel without finding, you know, the archaeological remains from some place or other. Histories uh, there haunting you whether you want it or mm. not. And yet, and yet, at the same time, it is, this, it, as a modern state, it is a, a, a place and a so society that has is extremely new, mm -hmm. that has had to invent itself. And it's had to invent itself both uh, as a reflection of and as a break from that history and that past. Um, and so when you are in Israel, particularly when you're in a place like Tel Aviv, mm. which is where the cultural capital of the country, you feel the vibrancy of this conversation, mm -hmm. that there, here are, is a people engaged in this difficult, angst-filled uh, conversation of who are we and, and what will we be? Uh, and you don't feel that, I don't think, in a society like uh, in any European society or even any American society. We are already too old, in a sense, <laughs> to feel that, that, that possibility. Uh, and so because these are characters who are in the, engaged in the act of the possibility for self-reinvention in, in the face of their history and past, it, it, it seemed um, t ideal. Mm -hmm. And also, um, one thing I found fascinating and also very entertaining in the way uh, the sort of the encounters uh, Nicole has as a result of this is the role of the the Jewish writer mm -hmm. in that actually sort of like the um, the the expectations placed on. On, on writers who write about uh, the Jewish experience or yes. the state of Israel by people for kind of, I guess, participating in that narrative and sort of and shaping it in a, in a particular way. Yeah, well, there, I mean, there's a lot of irony in those sort of comical scenes mm. in the book. But um, I think, look, whenever you are writing out of a certain region or realm uh, of... People, mm. whether it's uh, whether you're from Ireland or whether you're Muslim or you're Jewish or you're from mm, Libya, you 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 begin with your freedom. Mm -hmm. You don't feel uh, no. I don't think any artist in any medium feels that he or she wants to represent mm. anything beyond his or her own individuality, instincts, explorations. But uh, lo and behold, as you <laughs> and enter, as your work becomes public, somehow you become that, mm -hmm. or people take you to be that, They w either in a way that's oppositional or in a way that's an embrace. Mm -hmm. um, and it's totally unexpected and uh, confusing and, and can be funny, mm -hmm. um, or can be <laughs> destructive, depending on... <laughs> The scene. <laughs> and uh, just to conclude, um, I'd like to bring in the subject of Kafka. I don't think we should talk necessarily too much about okay. the the role that Kafka plays in the books. I think it's something that is uh, interesting for readers to discover. But um, in a sense, I mean, I, I I guess Kafka is not necessarily uh, always held up as kind of a uh, as necessarily a Jewish writer. Yeah. Um, and yet, uh, there's something that <laughs> comes out. Um, when you write about him, uh, particularly I think concerning the the current situation uh, in Israel and Palestine, that makes there sort of like very very interesting parallels between the way in which Kafka thought and the yes. the political situation unfolding. Then I just wanted, would you be able to just talk a little bit about sort of your relationship with Kafka as a writer and and why you felt uh, the the urge yeah, to write about him? Um, well, it's a I, it's a long answer. I tried to find ways to make it short. Um, I mean, 
from the time that I was really young, Kafka always felt uh, familiar to me, literally like family, in ways that I couldn't always describe. And I think there's a way in which, you know, like a kind of crazy uncle in your family <laughs> that you're forever grateful to, um, he opened a pathway for thinking and being for many of us that otherwise wouldn't have existed. And so there's this kind of huge gratitude towards him. Um, there are so many ways in which he became a guiding ghost to this book, and and I think you're right. Maybe we won't give away too many of those in the, that story, um, but I will say, you know, the um, Kafka wrote this really beautiful. He he, he um, as modest as Kafka was, somewhere or other he said that he wrote about the fall of man, um, perhaps you know he understood it maybe better than anyone you know and i would agree with him about that he his short brief writings um about biblical texts were astonishing uh, and he has one that is about a couple um that he wrote um i believe he wrote them in zura which is where he went uh, right after he was first diagnosed with tuberculosis um and he writes about um our the problem with our our misinterpretation of the story of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, and what he says is that it's not because we ate from the tree of knowledge um, that we were you know um, exiled. That in fact uh, the mistake, our human mistake, was that there between these two trees, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life, we failed to eat from the right tree. We didn't eat from the tree of life. And, and had we eaten from the tree of life, we would have um, imbibed, we would have digested and known that we have in us this uh, eternal spark. Um, and, and thus we would have never had to uh, be exiled to mortality and to, or to life as we know it. Um, and it's such beautiful thought. And I think, you know, in a sense, um, it's this, along with so many other things, became kind of a guiding idea in this book. So it's over to you. We're going to take like two or three questions and please do try and keep them as brief as possible uh, and then we'll, we'll get you moving. We'll get the air circulating um, again while everyone has a glass of wine. Um, if you have a question for Nicole Krauss, just raise your hand. We'll get a, a microphone to you. I actually had a quick question. Well, you, you, you kick yeah. us off then. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering if you can tell us about your decision to include the photographs in the book. Yeah, I think it was um, first this feeling of, well, how is a description, a, a description in language enough alone to give the reader this sense of this building? But then over time, I began to feel that this was another way to, in a sense, um, help in the conversation of questioning reality. Here are these pictures of this hotel, and it, they suggest to you exactly this sense of it, the evidence of the reality of this place. But then what happens in this, in this novel, in this place, becomes so surreal that in a sense, maybe it colors our, our, our sense of its existence. So it was just a way to provoke further thought about it. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? <coughs> oh, there's a lady just towards the back there. Got a hand up. Question. Which of your books is your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, none of them. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, the, it's always... The, the, each book is a reflection of who you are in this moment in life. And so the most recent is the most accurate reflection of, of, of who you are. And so I feel a kind of loyalty to it, or I feel that it's authentic in a way um, that I felt all the other books were too, but now they're far from me. I mean, my first novel I wrote when I was 25. I didn't <coughs> hardly remember the person who wrote that book. It may be a case of bad memory, or it may be that, that that's how life happens. Um, so it's hard to feel the, that kind of closeness or intimacy with something written so long ago. 
want to thank you for writing that book. It's my favorite book ever. And mm-hmm. I love the way it was laid out. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you're talking, you know, when whatever character is talking to Leon it toward the end of the book, and they're sitting on benches. Yeah. And one is sitting on one bench, the other one the bench opposite them. And the dialogue goes on the page one on one side, one on the other, I thought, wow! <laughs> it was just, you know, an amazing epiphany for me. And I want to thank you for your writing. And and um, I'm going to read this one again. I read it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And yes. A friend of mine got it for me and got it signed. Aww. But um, at the end, I didn't know how it ended. But I'm going to go back and I'm going <laughs> to try again. Uh-huh, yeah. So thank, thank, you. thank you for your work. I think we have a take a final question from this lady just in the corner there. Yeah. You had said in the beginning that you don't know the end of the story when you first begin it. If that's the case, how do you approach the characterization of your characters? Is it like when you sit down in a coffee shop with a stranger and you kind of have that conversation? Do you have a mental conversation to discover who these people are? Or as you are going through the trip that the trip of the novel, you discover more about the characters? Yeah, only through writing. Um, it, it, it's not something that just happens uh, while I'm sleeping or... You know, it's, it isn't that I don't have ideas outside of the writing room. Of course I do. And particularly when I'm in the thick of the novel, ideas come at me from all directions about what should happen um, or don't, as the case may be, too, which I know all too well, that position. But in terms of the, the characters' personalities developing, it's happening sentence by sentence and page by page. And I'm getting to know them in the sense at the pace in which you are getting to know them. Sometimes uh, that means I go back and I have to alter something. Sometimes it means I go back and discover something was there that I didn't realize was there. And, and maybe unconsciously it got laid into the character and then I use it, I grab it. Um, but um, they don't come to me fully formed, these people. They come to me with a... I have a strong intuition about them. And as a writer, I've learned w- what it means to follow those intuitions. That is all we've got time for. Just to uh, refer back to the lady's question about which was your favorite book. You're, you're all in... Uh, you, you, it's your lucky day because we have all of um, Nicole's backlist uh, mm-hmm. today so if you'd like to discover uh, all the different novels and decide for yourself which is your favourite they're all available at the till as is of course uh, as of course plenty of copies of, um, of Forest Ark a truly extraordinary surprising um, yeah incredibly incredibly daring incredibly uh, striking novel and I really really can't recommend it heartily enough um, so Pick up your copies at the till. I'm sure Nicole Krauss will be happy to sign them for you. Um, otherwise, stick around for a glass of wine and just join me one more time in saying thank you to Nicole Krauss. <laughs>